Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the panel on preventing future pandemics. Uh, I'm George Post, Professor of Health Innovation at Arizona State University. I apologize for the late start with an electromagnetic pulse hitting uh, Arizona. Uh, just a quick vignette, I've had a career in industry, was Chief Science and Technology Officer for now GSK, uh, interestingly, the individual in charge of Operation Warp Speed, Munsef Salawi, was uh, uh, in my organization. I have a very high regard for him. Uh, have an extensive engagement in public policy issues of biodefense, member of the Defense Science Board, Academy of Medicine, uh, Global Forum on Infectious Diseases, member of the Council for Foreign Relations. And most of my research relates to molecular diagnostics and synthetic biology. Uh, I'm delighted we've got four very well credentialed panelists with extensive experience on infectious disease and biosecurity issues that uh, span international, national, and local levels, and the full spectrum of clinical medicine, epidemiology, science, and public policy. The format is the fact I have a few questions for each, and they're, of course, welcome to offer their own perspectives, and they have the unenviable task of trying to respond some pretty multi-dimensional questions within a, a 10 minute uh, time frame. So I try and keep bios to a minimum. Uh, first speaker will be Dr. Annie Sparrow, who is a professor of population health science and policy at the ICANN School of Public Health at Mount Sinai, special advisor to the director of WHO. She's a pediatric intensivist and has frontline experience in some of the most challenging settings in the world in terms of refugee and detention camps and has extensive publication records in polio, cholera, Ebola, coronaviruses, antimicrobial resistance and pandemic threats. So Annie, some questions uh, to you. Uh, uh, WHO has obviously received considerable criticism, justified or not, from the US administration, including the decision to withdraw funding so the first question would be what can be done to strengthen the WHO and international health regulations. The second one, again, uh, equally multidimensional, the focus on the vaccine has received substantial US government, well, multiple government funding around the world. It's seen unprecedented cooperation between large corporations and certainly unprecedented media and political attention. So. I think it would be nice to hear your views on the status timing uh, for vaccine development, the challenges logistically of how do, is it going to be distributed and how do we ensure equity and global access. And if time allows, uh, what's your view about the possibility of uh, COVID-19 undergoing antigenic drift and shift in analogous fashion? To influenza complicating the vaccine logistic production cycle. So uh, if you could uh, attempt to tackle those questions, we'd be grateful. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So um, to the first, I mean, one of the issues about WHO and IHR, the International Health Regulations, which were developed uh, with the aim of protecting all people everywhere and at the same time while limiting the effect on trade, is that you know, during a pandemic, then you have all of the governments wanting you know, to strengthen WHO and wanting to reform the, the IHR. And yet, the minute that the pandemic is over, well, then we revert back to normal. And the default, unfortunately, really is, is that uh, you know, member states would prefer to actually have their own uh, authority to be able to say when, or, when you know, WHO is allowed to come in on, or not. And WHO fundamentally, of course, has received a lot of criticism, as you point out, but fundamentally, WHO's first role is as a coordination body. And you know, that means that you know, no effective coordination process begins with alienating or chastising you know, the central um, state, as it were, in this case, China. So you know, WHO is not in a position where it can actually uh, you know, criticise when it's trying to coordinate, and so it's particularly difficult at this time. Um, and during, you know, we've watched this before that even after uh, SARS and the IHR were already under the process of revision. So at that time, because of SARS, which affected a whole lot of um, uh, healthcare workers, as we know, um, and was reported on ProMed, which is the open source platform 
for diseases for doctors to report like myself and that's that's relevant because of course governments prefer to cover up i mean that's just standard practice it's public health 101 or outbreak 101 governments prefer to cover up there's any number of incentives to do so um whether it's political or economic or tourism or trade so you know that means all of the early incentives are to downplay rather than to report that's not always the case we saw you know in a, in a timely reporting of, of swine flu influenza h1n1 in 2009 by both mexico and the us but the overall tendency is to cover up and so um, beginning with, you know, like SARS in China in 2003 was reported on ProMed, the open source platform. So was MERS and um, so was, you know, the, the SARS too, the coronavirus, they're all reported on ProMed, which is the open source way to report. And that is also significant because it's a great way to disseminate and, and report quickly. It's where doctors actually exploited the, you know, the internet is, the minute it was developed in order to be able to get the word out, but also to share information because that's, you know, that's what you do. And one of the, the problems, of course, is that while the IHR recognised that in the revision where you can now have a, uh, a non-official source reporting to WHO, um, you know, which then, you know, in this case, for example, WHO then reaches out back to China to say, hello, uh, what's going on? Could you please verify the information we've received? Well, um, even then, China didn't report uh, in a timely manner. They meant to do so in 24 hours. And... Uh, what they also did, and that one of the criteria for calling a, a, a uh, public health emergency of international concern is to um, is whether or not healthcare workers are infected, which is clearly a sign of human to human transmission, and um, and and it's one of the criteria that is given a lot of weight. And what we know now, of course, is that China not only downplayed and covered up and suppressed, but they also uh, did that, you know, create, you know, continued that fiction at um, both at domestic and international level so that doctors across, across Wuhan and across China were not uh, told that they were at risk, were not allowed to wear PPE and uh, so they were you know, very much exposed um, in uh, you know, when it is a, a, an obscene sort of way to carry on this kind of fiction. So the, the real question is, is that what can we do to strengthen things? Not very much. What we can do is, of course, give WHO a lot more funding because they need more, clearly. Um, there's any number of emerging threats. They're accelerating and, you know, we're all hung up about COVID-19, but what about COVID-25 and COVID-28? I mean, this, of course, is only the first pandemic and they clearly keep getting worse. Um, but um, in terms of you know the IHR revision, it's hard to see what can be done that won't then be co-opted or, or by you know, by the next government. It's clear that when you write these things in, then China, for example, just then works harder at suppressing uh, or, or working around the clauses. So. Um, and they don't have to obey them. But the only thing you really can do is you can create a um, like a stand-in approval where where uh, a team from WHO and, or international like team of experts, which WHO is very good at assembling, can actually enter the country at any time, uh, not just when there's a report for an outbreak. And that's something that is written into other countries when they, for example, they join the Human Rights Council. And it's one way to actually up the political cost of covering up. Short of that, um, you know, I think that's where we kind of see the limits um, to some extent what we can do about the IHR revision. We certainly can, um, you know, can acknowledge the issues that uh, we're at a stage where uh, you know, superpowers would clearly you know, not, rather not cooperate and then cooperate and holding WHO hostage to that is not very helpful. Now, as to the vaccine issue, um, well, you know, of course, we're used to thinking about vaccines as the as the panacea, as the cure, and that can go so far. Of course, the vaccine is, is very helpful, and we're all looking to it as a clue, as the key to getting back to work, pay, trade, travel. And you know, the only you know the real problem is, of course, you know, here as you all know, we are dealing with. You know, new ways of making the vaccine, new platforms, new processes, faster than ever. Um, and of course, on top of that, it's being politicized in ways that mean, you know, when it is rolled out, are we going to see it being uptaken? There's a very big difference between vaccines and vaccinations. And we saw that also with H1N1, that though a vaccine was made very quickly, um, rolling it out and getting uptake is not so easy. And there's already that existing level of 
anti-vaxxers or, you know, that as a barometer of trust. And, and we all know that the trust in our authorities is not so high right now. So whether you could actually get to a level of, of immunity using a vaccine is uh, questionable. You know, there's a real global shortage of trust. And we saw this with Ebola too in, uh, in Eastern Congo, where I worked for many years, that, you know, for the first time we had a, a vaccine and a test right from the word go, and we had you know, four experimental treatments, which, you know, two of which ended up being very effective within a year. But it's still, you know, that was clearly not enough to stop the, you know, the, uh, the outbreak. It took an enormous amount of work. And we know that, you know, even the best biomedical solution requires social traction and trust, you know, for uptake. But, but it doesn't, um, but we don't seem to learn that lesson. So I think that, um, a vaccine can go so far and vaccines can go you know, so far. Um, of course, we need to protect those on the front lines um, and you know, those who are vulnerable, the elderly are at high risk. I do think there are um, other ways which are very much worth exploring, some of which are the BRACE trial exploring the, in the uh, utility of the BCG vaccine um, to train immunity and offer a partial pandemic protection and could it, in effect, you know, if it shows to be effective and the results, well, there's every reason to be optimistic because um, we, we do know that it is very effective at reducing respiratory virus, viruses in the elderly, for example, but also in, in neonates where their mortality is from other causes of, hep of sepsis is halved. Um, but that type of vaccine and other live vaccines that, like um, MMR and um, potentially others, yellow fever even, and that might, you know, those might be better ways of actually uh, offering pandemic protection in the longer term. But, and I'm sure, I'm not sure if I've gone over 10 minutes, but it's, um, you know, I think more broadly, we, we are stuck on this model of disease control. And that, you know, we have to like, you know, solve them with, with vaccines. You know, it's a very sort of negative approach to health. And you can see this when WHO revised the definition of health in 1948 when they, when they came into being, really, and they said it's not just the evidence of disease, it is the presence of you know, full physical, uh, emotional and social well-being and mental well-being. And that's that's a very different you know, definition from the absence of disease. And and, and we are stuck, sort of stuck in this very negative mindset where we're just, we're trying, we're still stuck on absence. So, fi so, final, so final comment. Um, so final was, comment, and he, uh, final okay. comment as we come to closure with the impossible tasks that each of you have got. Just a quick speculation on the challenge of mutability and antigenic drift and shift. Well, I think that's not so much of a, of a question here that um, it was, as with influenza, which is a far, you know, which mutates very, very rapidly and swiftly. And that's, um, that's not something we see with Corona. Yes, there are mutations. We haven't seen you know, anywhere near as fast as with influenza. and. Um, and that in itself is not meant to be a huge barrier to the vaccine. I mean, I think a more question is the, is the fact that as per the pediatric multi-inflammatory sy syndrome shows us that there are real questions around the disease and our ability to make antibodies and how the disease affects that process, which you know, raises very you know, more concerns about the efficacy of the vaccine in the long run. Right. Well, thank you. And again, and with apologies for the reiteration, you've all got a very difficult task to try and summarize a vast amount of information, but thank you. So our next panelist is uh, Alex Deegan, who uh, I think every every panelist has had, got a pretty impressive and eclectic career, but uh, Alex might be the winner here in terms of being the CEO and founder of Conservation X Labs, which is a new startup company. He is a colleague here at ASU in the newly established Global Futures Laboratory. And certainly in the context of this panel, his service as chief scientist of USAID, where he stood up the uh, agency's Global Development Laboratory, which is their equivalent of uh, DARPA. And he was also influential in the USAID Policy Bureau. Uh, extensive overseas experience by definition and certainly in Afghanistan, where he was not only the founder of the Wildlife Conservation Society there, uh, created Afghanistan's first national park, and is author of the book on the Snow Leopard Project, which, uh, if any of you have seen it, uh, reached deserved rating 
in the nature reviews uh, as one of the top science books of 2019. So much lurks within everyone's bio, but uh, keep, keep it to a minimum. So Alex, uh, welcome. I like, question I'd like to pose to you is what is the link or probably more accurately, the linkage is plural between conservation, sustainability, pandemic risk, and the increasing appropriate emphasis on the One Health concept, and what needs to be in place to better understand the pandemic risk spectrum and zoonotic threats in particular. And if time does allow, since you've been working on a point of care, point of need nucleic acid identification test, which will clearly be very valuable in global biosurveillance, if time allows, make some comment. But if you could uh, kick us off and start talking about at least the, the general principles of One Health. Yeah, I, you know, um, I think where I'd like to sort of start is in 2009, I was on the policy planning staff at the State Department for Secretary Rice, and we were dealing with the aftermath of SARS and had spent billions of dollars responding to SARS. Tara knows this probably extremely well. And I'd written a memo because uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist and tropical biologist by training uh, to Secretary Rice that said, you know, look, the United States is reactive to emerging infectious diseases. Uh, there will be more of these. Uh, and we need to think about the reasons of how to prevent the upstream factors that give rise to them. Rather than reacting to each one at a time, let's actually think about why they're arising and what those reasons are. And if you think about uh, conservation actually and climate change and how we address sustainability, our food systems uh, and think about global health have a lot to offer here. So climate change obviously is one. Uh, it expands the range and the impact of pathogens. We know that dengue is, is uh, you know, which really what was only on our borders uh, is expected to hit New York City in the Midwest by 2080. Uh, and we're seeing new pathogens. It brings in, uh, it changes the, the range and fitness of predators or competitors that might limit spread in other places. Um, they allow certain types of diseases to thrive um, uh, outside of what was their previous tolerance uh, risks. And we see this with pests and pathogens across the board for agriculture, for, for wood. Um, environmental degradation is the second one. And, and obviously we saw that with NEPA when in Malaysia there was uh, environmental degradation where bats were defecating over uh, and, and eating fruit and dropping the fruit over pig pens that led to a spillover uh, between animals and uh, wild animal, domestic animals and humans. Um, the changes in the landscape geometry. So one of the things I found in Madagascar uh, where I was doing research was, was that lemurs and fragments actually get malaria that, at rates that they were not getting in intact forests. Uh, so the changes in the geometry allows for, the edge effects allows for uh, interest, um, opportunity. Uh, then there's literally the amount of stress on the animals in those degraded environments, uh, which cause increased shedding of viruses at higher rates. Uh, there's things like logging and subsistence agriculture. Destruction of the environment gives us, puts us in closer proximity, much as what we saw with NEPA. Uh, and then there's things like bushmeat. And that's really the third area is wildlife trade, which includes bushmeat, wildlife markets, uh, farm species, and the pet trade, which has affected, you know, monkeypox here in the United States, uh, what we have. And it is, you know, that is what is suspected here with SARS-CoV-2, uh, with the jump from horseshoe bats, uh, somehow to pangolins, and then pangolins within the wet market in Wuhan. And in general, globalization and invasive species has resulted in a rapid increase and in transfer of species around the world, either as hitchhikers uh, or through direct transfer. Uh, and they serve as vectors for the introduction of, of, of pathogens into novel regions. But I think kind of, you know, the way to think about this is through the framework of planetary health, which is that the fundamental gains that we have made in food security and global health and education can actually be reversed because of the way this, that we are managing the environment are undermining all those things. So I think we're set to kind of rethink conservation no longer as uh, separate from development and separate from global health, but actually encompassing as how we get to it. And I think that's where the, the answers are. 
Um, we know the cost of this pandemic high. It's expected to be between eight trillion to uh, fifteen trillion dollars. Uh, SARS outbreak was eleven to thirty billion dollars. Um, so let's think about what are the things we could do. The first one is just really simple. We can end subsidies that undermine planetary health at home and abroad. We can increase uh, domestic surveillance, uh, creating essentially some sort of viral weather report uh, through you know, a whole set of new technologies, including the ones that we're developing, of handheld detection units that could give quick, quick answer that allow us to have the data understand hotspots that by itself uh, Tara will say is not enough. Uh, and so we need to think about how we actually integrate global health, one health, and conservation around what we're doing and change the fundamental incentives that drive extinction and pandemics and replace those drivers of extinction uh, and pandemics uh, with better products, which we're seeing across the board that we can do. And I can get into that later um, and, and think about that. And that fundamentally means our food systems. That fundamentally means our supply chains. And there's emerging technology that allows us to do that. Uh, just a word on the device, and I'll, I'll, I'll end on that. Um, you know, we created the device actually for Walmart trafficking uh, to create a device that is uh, highly specific, highly sensitive, portable battery power, and doesn't involve separate reagents, requires you not only to have no scientific literacy, but no literacy, and can get you an answer within 30 minutes. What is the spectrum of organisms you can assay with that device? So, so it's all DNA, RNA. Uh, so we essentially recognize with the COVID uh, outbreak that we wanted to, to, to help contribute to, to solving that problem, or at least uh, being able to reduce its impact. And so we started working on uh, with the Broad Institute at, at MIT uh, and Harvard to actually develop um, uh, these tests. Uh, just recently uh, got selected out of 20 with companies uh, through the RADx uh, competition to be one of 40 something called the RADx. Uh, so, so we're we're busy sort of uh, moving that along. But the, the, a lot of our work was really on analyzing human behavior to minimize risk and to create a sense of the ruggedness that would allow this to work uh, on the front lines of conservation. The same thing could allow us to have this work on the front lines in the developing world, in rural America, but also to serve as the infrastructure for a future system around surveillance. Thank you. So obviously the purpose in the field is a very different issue to a nice uh, cocoon central laboratory in the United States. Uh, so one quick uh, final comment from you with regard to embedding the One Health concept or indeed planetary health into certainly two major professional curricula, medicine and veterinary medicine. It still seems to be alarmingly absent from those curricula. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, increasing the answers in terms of education are what you see at ASU, where we are not really bound by discipline, but we're really, we're building education around problems and what is necessary to solve this problem, which means understanding veterinary science, which means understanding medicine and global health, which means understanding conservation and thinking about how those things allow you to prepare for where you're trying to go. Uh, that's definitely where, where people like Peter Slosser and Michael Crow have been trying to go with the, with the universe. Excellent, thank you. So our third panelist is uh, Dr. Tara Tool. I've had the privilege to work with Tara and more importantly learn from her over very extended periods of time. Uh, her bio is difficult to capture. Currently she's Vice President, Senior Fellow at InfuCal, which as many of you know, is investing in venture capital backed innovative technologies that can be rapidly fieldable within a six to 36 month time frame in the biosecurity arena. Previously, she was the Under Secretary of Science and Technology in the Department of Homeland Security. She was one of the co founders and catalysts for the prestigious uh, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Prior to that, service in the Clinton administration as Assistant Secretary for Environmental Safety, a fellow member of the Council of Foreign Relations, and she also served as chair of the board of Federation of American Scientists, are still there. And 
Mara, throw the unended questions to you. Uh, uh, the myriad gaps in biodefense preparedness which have been revealed in stark relief by the COVID-19 pandemic have been identified in multiple now dust gathering ports of the 25 years. Obviously a multi-dimensional question, but why? what, what are your views as to why the prescient warnings did not have any resonance? Second, specifically, out of today's pandemic, building on the inventory of deficit defined under two, uh, over 25 years, what should we be doing urgently to regress this situation? And if time allows, what benefits do we actually see coming from COVID-19? But I suppose uh, that actually looks to the earlier question of what are, what are the priorities that we should be implementing moving forward. Okay. Um, well, as everybody on this panel knows, um, the public health and uh, medical care community has been worried about epidemics and in particular pandemics for decades now. Epidemics have been with us throughout history um, but our potential for a big pandemic, such as we're now experiencing with COVID-19, has increased exponentially um, in the last uh, five decades or so, partly for the reasons that Alex talks about. <clears throat> Humans are intruding into once remote ecosystems where we're coming in contact, into contact with new bugs. Uh, we are uh, moving and trading around the globe at the speed of jet aircraft. So a bug in one cargo hold uh, can move into New York City as West Nile did in 99 overnight. And climate change is also affecting uh, where um, the vectors of infectious disease are and where they go. So we are living in an age of epidemics, and uh, this has been recognized for a long time. We've seen an uptick in the number of disease outbreaks, particularly those caused by what were originally animal bugs in the last 20 years, and the impacts of those outbreaks has been going up. And in fact, as we're seeing now in COVID, this threat uh, rises really across the world to the level of um, a national security um, emergency, virtually for all countries, and um, including the major powers like the United States and China. So as Dr. Sparrow said, governments traditionally, again throughout history, have downplayed the consequences of epidemics for economic reasons to hold on to political power so as not to frighten their populations, um, as one leader has recently said. Um, and it never works because the bugs will have their way. Um, there have been movements, I think, over the last 20 years. I, I will speak mostly to the US government, which I know best, to improve our preparedness. Bills have been passed. Uh, budgets have been um, somewhat increased and then usually decreased. There hasn't been a sustained commitment to pandemic preparedness over the last 20 years anywhere in the world, as far as I know. Um, and again, as Dr. Sparrow said, um, there hasn't been a lot of money flowing to institutions such as WHO who are charged with the responsibilities of coordinating outbreaks in spite of very strong wake-up calls like H1N1, like the Ebola outbreak, like SARS, like MERS. I mean, we can all recite uh, the history of very scary outbreaks um, over our lifetime. Um, and I think um, one of the characteristics of epidemics is also a characteristic of society at large, and that is denial. We don't want to think about worst case scenarios. We pass them off as highly unlikely or as something that somebody else should worry about, but not us. Um, but as we are seeing now, um, that kind of denial is very dangerous when it comes to epidemics because one, when one is upon you, you're not ready. Um, so we have, we have been talking about um, 
what technologies uh, could have helped us in responding to and quenching an epidemic. Um, and they fall into four buckets. One is you have to be able to diagnose and detect an epidemic. If you can't diagnose it, you can't track it, as the United States is demonstrating. We have no idea what's going on in India right now, other than it's bad. So the kind of technology that Alex is trying to get out to the world uh, would be very important in managing the epidemic. And it's very available. This is technology that exists on the planet today. It is not some far off wish. It exists, and as you know, George, it has existed for a long, long time. But the government has not, any government has not invested in making it real and manufacturing it at scale. And commercially, you know, it isn't a very good proposition. The second thing you have to do is protect the well. The best way to do that is vaccines. Failing that, you want personal protective equipment. We have the capacity now with modern biotechnology to make vaccines on demand. We just haven't bothered to get ready to do it. We're gonna have a vaccine or more than one vaccine, probably in a uh, historically record-breaking time period. Um, we should have had several vaccines ready and through safety trials by now, before the epidemic began. And what we don't have yet, and we're going to have to build from scratch, is the manufacturing capacity to serve the world. Because until we eradicate this in Botswana and South America, it's going to come back to America because of our trade and travel patterns. But we don't have that distribution system and we don't have that manufacturing system. Thirdly, the third bucket of technologies is how do we take care of the sick? We got remdesivir. We know that steroids help on severely ill patients, um, but we have severely screened certainly the American health system and the medical care system across some of the richer countries in the world. So we are leaving a large part of the globe to fend of itself effectively without modern health care in this pandemic. That too is avoidable. And finally, the final technology bucket that we ought to be much more advanced in is data. You need data to know what the heck is going on, where are the hot spots, where should you move resources. You need data to learn as you go. Epidemics are very long lived events. They're not like earthquakes. They're not like forest fires. They go on for months and years. And this one clearly is going to go on for years. We are not going to be done when the first vaccine gets approved by FDA. That's going to be the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. So there's a lot more we could have done in technologies and we didn't do. I think because leaders did not understand the likelihood and the impact of pandemics, maybe they will now. They may revert to, okay, done there, been that, let's forget about it, we'll see. We're gonna have to hold them accountable. And we have not invested in the kind of biotechnologies that are now possible, but not considered part of national security. In terms of what good may come of this, I think it will have mostly to do with awareness. Um, maybe the One Health concept will be more apparent to people. People will understand, or more people will understand better that the pandemic is a human consequence, is a, a consequence of human action. We did this. It's the way we use land, it's the way we develop commercially, it's the way we operate that made this pandemic and possible and will make others possible if we don't change our ways. Um, secondly, I am hoping that the governments of the world will have a much sharper idea of their own responsibilities in responding to and preventing these pandemics in terms of developing technologies uh, and in terms of how they have to manage these pandemics starting with, as was said earlier, the importance of maintaining trust and credibility among the publics they are trying to protect. A public that doesn't believe COVID is real, a public that attacks public health officials, uh, that scapegoats um, people who have been ill, that is not a society that can deal well with pandemics. Hopefully we will see that and change our ways. 
Tara is always a, a superbly cogent analysis. It sort of fits with my alliterative scale of five S's. But, uh, we need situational awareness. Starts with situational awareness across the entire spectrum. Uh, it needs scale. I think one thing that has come out of this event is the fact that uh, we are critically dependent upon the private sector, whether it be for diagnostics, therapeutics, or vaccines. And US government agencies had got very poorly developed understanding of the role, yet alone the financial incentives for the private sector. After scale, we need standards. One has to look at the abrogation of the FDA in setting any meaningful standard for emergency use authorization. So that we ended up with a wild west of diagnostics and we're heading towards a wild west of uh, serological testing. Uh, uh, but most importantly, it requires a system, systems-based integration, not only nationally, but internationally. And with that, it requires clearly definitive accountabilities and authorities. And as we've seen in the debacle in the United States, uh, the discharge of responsibility for the states rather than from the federal government has resulted in enormously variable state-by-state -state responses and in many instances states have to compete against each other for critical resources so if time allows we may come back uh, to those but thank you again for a very uh, cogent analysis the last speaker is my friend and colleague at asu dr neil woodbury who is the executive vice president of chief science and technology officer of the university in the so-called knowledge enterprise organization and he has the responsibility to oversee the full spectrum of ASU research and strategic partnerships. He's also a professor at the School of Molecular Sciences. And when I established the Biodesign Institute at ASU, he was an uh, absolutely crucial partner in enabling me to do that. He also serves as CEO of the Science Foundation of Arizona, and his own uh, research is on molecular diagnostics and machine learning tools for the identification of epitopes and pathogenic organization. But so in common with your fellow panelists, you know when you find time to speak. Uh, so the question I'd like to pose is bringing students back to school, whether it be K through 12 or at the college level, has been a controversial political and public health issue and certainly a formidable logistical problem to mitigate disease spread. Could you just give us a quick summary of ASU's experience as one of the largest university campuses in the country in addressing this challenge, mobilization of testing capabilities, and how do you juggle all of this with sustaining the mission in both education and, and research? If time allows, ASU's received deserved recognition for its very entrepreneurial approach in multiple domains, what new opportunities have materialized out of ASU in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Neil? Thanks very much. Hopefully you can hear me well. Um, so yes. uh, the, uh, uh, in answer to your, your first question, I think there are just a, a number of different things that are really important in thinking about how any organization, but certainly an organization size of ASU, uh, needs to be uh, both prepared to respond and to respond to something like this. Probably the first and most important aspect of the problem is just uh, really be agile. So we need to build this sort of agility and, and resilience into the way we operate so that we can move between modalities of operation in, uh, in a straightforward way. And so that's been a major aspect of what ASU did in the beginning and what it has done all along. I think, you know, our president, Michael Crow, is a, an individual that's, that strongly believes in having many different ways of solving problems on hand. And as a result, um, uh, different modalities of learning, different modalities of research, different ways of dealing with infrastructure on campus. Um, all of these were very important in being able to manage the disease uh, when it first started and continue to be very important now in terms of our ability to react depending on, um, react and proact, depending on the situation as it, uh, 
as it evolves. In addition to that, there's not much you can do if you can't measure things. And, uh, and being able to assess what's happening through a, a, a dark row tool. Mentioned this a little while ago. If you can't assess what's going on, you don't know how to uh, how to deal with it. And so, very quickly, when the uh, pandemic hit, our Power Design Institute, uh, you mentioned before, as when you initiated it, um, uh, it, it uh, under under Joshua Bear's leadership, uh, quickly put in place a, a PCR-based testing uh, capacity and scaled it rapidly so that we could use it and then. It was easy. Uh, so, and there's been continuous evolution and, and, and improvement of that and scaling that ever since to a point now where we, we should be able to, to uh, process about 10,000 samples a week. So that's the kind, or 10,000 samples a day, right? So that's the kind of thing that, uh, that, that was needed to put that sort of thing in place. At the same time, there were many different aspects of our community that we saw need in and, and uh, quickly uh, uh, put forward ideas and uh, capabilities. Certainly in the area of, of personal protective equipment, there was a great need in among some of our more vulnerable communities uh, in terms of not having the kind of personal protective equipment that they required to do uh, even the simplest of tasks. And so uh, we, we uh, networked a series of different uh, um, uh, systems in terms of additive manufacturing capabilities, uh, not only our own systems, but, but uh, partners in, in industry, and quickly tried to provide a portal by which these organizations could come and and get the kind of uh, uh, protective equipment that we that they need. The other large scale aspect of this that that is important is is modeling. You actually have to have an analysis of the data. You have to be able to try and understand where the data is, where it where it's going, what its biases are, how good is the data itself, and then um, utilize that. Because in it, in the public health regime, data is never perfect. These are not lab rats that you can control. So you are constantly looking at your data, trying to understand where it comes from, what it's telling you, and, and why. And so we quickly partnered with the state to do that, as well as partnering with the state to put together um, testing capabilities all across the state, which we're running currently now. Um, so all of that was something that we tried to put together very quickly, which I think was fairly successful in that regard. Um, uh, then on, on top of that, uh, obviously there were much longer term issues that we needed to begin to address. And so we put together a series of about 10 research uh, teams made of groups of professors and their and faculty and their, their, their uh, respective laboratories uh, and, and uh, parsed out a lot of the different kinds of problems that one faces a pandemic like this, and that we will face, as has been pointed out, going forward, things like vaccine development. And we focus not so much on development of the vaccine that is going to be out in the next few months, we hope, but the development of vaccines for these kinds of problems. As, as Dr. O'Toole said, we are not there yet in terms of, of utilizing known capabilities to create vaccines rapidly. Well, how do we put that in place? How do you do that? How do you make them extremely manufacturable? These kinds of questions. And then in addition to, to the technical aspects like vaccines and drugs and, and diagnostics, all of which uh, different aspects of these groups were working on, uh, ways of, of, of advancing. There's also issues of how do you understand the economic effects of a disease? How do you understand the psychological effects of the disease? And so we put together groups uh, that, uh, that that are studying these issues um, as well. And so uh, this has sparked a tremendous amount of activity on campus uh, from from that point of view. Um, uh, and and like uh, uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Diggin, uh, we have uh, uh, a number of people looking at this issue of how do we get distributed diagnostic. That's another very important uh, aspect of the problem that I, I, I've talked to him about, and I'm very impressed with some of the work uh, that they're doing. Um, 
in terms of this this larger picture of, of what are the opportunities going forward and and how do they play out how will they play out uh i i think again this concept of resilience and flexibility is a lesson that we somehow all need to learn from this pandemic the idea that we should think about business we should think about our organizational capabilities we should think about our government organizations etc in terms of this concept of resilience and, and adaptability so thinking about entrepreneurial ways in some you know in, in, in many respects to to make us more adaptable to problems as they arise as things change going to see going forward obviously another area that i think is is really critical that that both um uh that all of our speakers so far have talked about uh, in one way or another is this network of information about what's happened uh, i mean the reality is that here we are in uh, well into the the, the, the century uh, with all of the capabilities we have and yet the vast majority of the time when we get sick we have no idea what we're sick um, we, we don't know what kind of virus it is we don't know what's going around uh, it's just not uh, we don't have a, a level of detail of information about that that uh, that would be that would be uh, useful in terms of thinking about how we the disease and certainly not in terms of thinking about what unusual things may be popping up in different areas that we don't know about, how soon they pop up where they pop up etc so building a capability at this point now that we've sort of got our attention on on the basis of technologies that exist we don't as, as dr O'Toole said we don't have to invent all this for the new technology we have to implement it and and use use this in order to, to build a, a robust network so that when things are happening we know what's happening at a molecular detail and we we know it quickly and we know it more or less ubiquitously. so uh, i think that's a tremendous opportunity now from the point of view of building something and if we do that it won't just help us in the pandemic this is all concepts and capabilities that are going to improve the health of our, our society. I will tell you, since this happened, I've been watching in, in ASU, I've been watching our, our visits to the health center here and, and how they changed and whatnot. Uh, it's, it, you'd think in a, it's the health center would go way up. No, they go way down because these kids aren't getting everything else under the sun because they're, they're much more isolated from each other. They're not passing the other sort of normal things around. So in fact, the numbers of visits go, go down. And as we start to think about how to build networks and create things, we could substantially improve the health of, uh, of society and the effectiveness of the workplace by putting some of these things in place. So I think those are all tremendous opportunities for going forward. Thank you, Neil, and obviously a number of and thanks to all the panelists for keeping to time and summarizing some extraordinarily complex multi-dimensional issues with eminent succinctness. Clearly, a number of co uh, overarching themes exist beyond the obvious issue of long-standing neglect, uh, funding of public health and biopreparedness, uh, the and the political apparatus that must be put in place to be able to respond to those deficits. But I think that uh, the point made by several speakers with regard to the fact that this is uh, a systems of systems problem, and it sums at the final level to planetary health and the complex interplay between uh, diverse ecosystems, of which we are just one member, Clearly, is something that is going to require very sophisticated and uh, great diligence to actually put in place type of interaction networks needed to monitor this. And even there are many topics we didn't get to discuss on today's panel. But one, of course, is the fact that agricultural biosecurity, agriculture is a free trillion dollar economy just in the US, let alone the broader implications of food security and humanitarian crises to come, courtesy of uh, and uh, epizootic disease in 
uh, livestock population. But it would seem that uh, uh, absent therapeutics and uh, at vaccine, which is the situation we found ourselves in, the point which has been made by all, you know, all the panelists is we really need to know what's out there. So it does come back to the issue of comprehensive global bio surveillance. And once we have found that something has arrived in our midst, how can we quickly mobilize against it? And a risk of undue bias, because it's a field that I've tried to push for many years without success, I would argue that diagnostic capabilities are at the core of all of this, both for biosurveillance, early detection of disease to be able to both better manage the ill as well as protect the worried well. Uh, but as, as Dr. O'Toole indicated, we're not technology gated in this regard. Uh, certainly, there will be improvements, subtle, incremental, in some cases, radical in those technologies, but they're deployable now, whether it be for complex centralized laboratories or, as Alex indicated, the much more important need for distributed diagnostics into in-field situations to give us real-time situational awareness. But again, uh, uh, it's really a 3D problem, as I call it. It's diagnostics and distributed data. Unless we actually have a very cogent and facile system for both accurate capture of information, as Neil indicated, but the, you only have to look at what is seemingly one of the most technologically sophisticated nations on the earth, the US, to just look at the shortcomings in our electronic healthcare systems where public health labs are still sending information by fax. We're still in a situation where medical practitioners are sending materials by fax. And this lack of interoperability between databases and unwillingness both in the research community as well as the clinical community to share data is a rate limiting factor that I hope that we will uh, find ourselves being able to focus on as another benefit coming from this. Even though this gets dangerously close to heresy, I think we've got to seriously reevaluate the capabilities of CDC, FDA, and NIH to respond to, fund to, to pandemic threats, not just in terms of more fundamental research that may be needed, but in terms of Neil's point about what are the agile systems that we need to have put in place. And as a point made earlier, the critical interface with the private sector and then the scalability of the private sector, because all of this is, of course, going on while other disease demands on the healthcare system are there. So if you divert one vaccine strain, uh, vaccine plant to the latest uh, pathogen, you're potentially uh, shortcoming the supply chain. And that, of course, then opens up another issue we haven't touched on today, which is supply chains at large, whether it be for PPE, ventilators, uh, therapeutics, uh, and, uh, and not, not just uh, in the context of pandemic care, but we have a large number of the population who are practicing polypharmacy on a daily basis, particularly the elderly, the average 65 is now taking five medicines a day, the average 75 year old is taking 11 medicines a day, and most of those are generic, and most of those are sourced externally to the US and Europe, if not the final product, uh, the uh, active uh, I I ingredients. But I think that we've got to certainly ask what are the optimum public private partnerships that need to be in place if we're going to be able to respond with the level of agility that has been uh, identified. But perhaps the most challenging issue of all, which all the panelists have raised, is this very, uh, in the current corona climate that we see in contemporary politics, most notably in the United States, how do we actually chart a consensus, not only for political leadership, but a willingness to grasp the net with the intrinsic complexity of these problems, not only to create new frameworks of interagency cooperation, coordination nationally, uh, but internationally. And although those words should easily off the tongue, all of us who've had any flirtation 
actually trying to get these things done, and as I indicate, all the more so in the in the current deficiencies that now pervade all aspects of political debate in Washington, this is a formidable problem uh, that society will have to confront, even if uh, we hope some lessons are learned from COVID-19. Uh, we will certainly be back at the table, and let us hope it's not another 25 years of dusty shell reports before we're able to confront the next pandemic, because it will clearly be with us. So. My thanks to everyone on the panel, not only for your insights, more importantly, your extensive ongoing contributions to global health, in biosecurity, in clinical medicine, in some of the most remote and challenging parts of the world, in public health, both delivering preparedness planning and uh, research and education. And, and for those of you watching this panel discussion, my thanks, and I hope that you've found it informative. So, colleagues, uh, Patrick, thanks very much. It's always a great pleasure to see all of you. And thanks, thanks for uh, your insights. Much appreciated. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.